I'm not here to tell you about the future of media. Um, let me make, make that clear right at the get-go. I also want to tell you that after me, um, you guys know Roman, right? Uh, your new, new editor. I have uh, a little gossip that apparently he's a really good singer, really good guitarist. And the big surprise is the special performance may actually just be Roman. But who knows? Let's see what happens. So listen, um, quickly, I'm going to go through this whole thing. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's such, such a, an education for me to be here. It's wonderful. I'm going to talk about how to build a viable media business, right? Um, and along the way, this is going to be a very quick journey uh, to take you through some of these points. They seem unrelated, but I promise you they're related. So it's going to be why do you exist? I'm going to be asking you um, what problem you're solving, who you're solving it for, whether you have this mysterious thing called product market fit, and I'm also going to ask you whether you're in the gambling business. But let's see how this goes. So a little bit about Splice. Um, we, we do this, we set ourselves up because we realized that journalists needed help with running a business. Um, and we do a number of these things. There are a lot of verbs on this page. Um, but we do all of these things in order to help journalism creators, businesses, startups. Um, we work with the media ecosystem globally, but mainly for Asian media startups. So a number of newspapers around the world, you know, the, and news organizations around the world would kind of use me to figure out how to productize their offerings productize their journalism. And believe it or not, um, in 2023, journalism also means you run things like Himal Media Mela. What we're doing here, ladies and gentlemen, it, it is not a surprise. This is journalism. You know, the idea that these guys are, in fact, convening this amazing crowd of talent and, and, and minds is, is where journalism is going right now. And, and this is very much the future. But I'm not here to tell you about the future. I am going to tell you that one of the first steps towards building a viable media business, and by viable we mean, I'll get to that, what I mean by viable, is first start with the media, with a business strategy. And what does this mean? Let's look at what it doesn't mean. How many of you find this, uh, that this is, a, this is a familiar statement? I'm gonna get a whole bot lot of money, I'm going to set up a newsroom, I'm going to get an office, 10 journalists, lots of laptops, and make some fantastic YouTube videos of journalism that matters. So, okay, I can hear some laughter. Uh, <laughs> okay, then here's also what uh, it isn't. Hey man, Kunda, let's do a podcast. You know, people like podcasts, my mom likes podcasts. Let's all do podcasts, you know. Listen, we're all only doing 20 stories a week. Can we start doing with fewer reporters? Can you double this? And can you get like triple more page views? Okay. Also not business. You know what these sound like to me? A business guy, a guy who's trying to get, get you guys paid. It sounds very much like gambling. It's like, let's do all this work. Let's do all this journalism. Let's do all this effort and take all these people with all this talent and then throw it out there and see what hits. Hopefully something will hit with the advertiser, with the, this audience, whatever that is. And I'm here to tell you, let's look at a case study of a little known company, let's say, called Nike, right? These guys say, let's come to Kathmandu and let's build basketball shoes. We make bas really good basketball shoes. We love making basketball shoes. In fact, let's set up a factory. And let's put a whole lot of money. Why produce one, right? Let's keep producing. Let's put $20 million into this basketball shoe factory. Uh, we do, we love them. We are very good at this. Let's market them more and more. Let's market all these shoes and make sure that we're getting the message out there. We make the best basketball shoes. But somehow this is not working. So you go out in the streets. And you ask someone, hey man, what's going on? What shoes do you want? Don't you want basketball shoes? 
we make really good basketball shoes. And they say, no, we actually really like football. <laughs> Embarrassing silence. <laughs> now what, you know? So I'm saying, hello product, please meet my friend, market. And I'm saying, like, maybe we should introduce these two. What if we ask the market, crazy thought, what if we ask the market, hey, listen, what shoes do you want? What if they say we don't want shoes at all? We want basketball courts. We want football. We play football. So what I'm trying to say here is you're in the business of telling truth to power. And I'm in the business of making sure that you do this tomorrow. And then I'd like you to do it for 10 more or years. And then, you know, pay your rent, pay those people you hired, pay salaries, take a holiday, live good life. So business strategy, if we really think about it, perhaps it's really answering these three quest questions, right? Where are we now? Where do we want to be? And how should we get there? So this is how we think you, we get there. We've seen this happen over and over. At Splice, we make our money being consultants, consultants to, and ad advisors to grant people, you know, people with money, to journalists, to journalism creators, to large media organizations, media startups. Solve a problem for somebody. What problem are you solving? Who are you solving it for? So let's break that down, right? You've got A. How do you get from A, the problem, to B, the solution? Getting there can be quite messy, right? It can be really complicated. But at least it tells you where you are and where you're ending up. It looks like a map, right? Imagine a map without you are here or where your destination is. You start to draw this map and then you start to be, hopefully, obsessed with this. What if we are, as journalists, obsessed with the problem we're solving, who we're solving it for, and will they find it useful? Can I make money doing this? Is there a value exchange? Are people going to say, shut up and take my money? We should be obsessed with this product market fit thing. We should start calling it market product fit. First ask the market. Maybe then make your product. So what if it's not this? What if it's this instead? We've been working with this me method quite a lot. Maybe I don't need that money right now. Maybe I'm going to put that money into going and making an assumption Hey, listen, I think this is the problem you have. We'll come to what those problems are later. This is the solution we have. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I think that's a little useful. I could find that. Okay. And then you start to make media or journalism or content or whatever you call it that is that complicated route from A to B. Maybe that's the way forward. Maybe this has been done over and over again in small ways and that have made a huge difference. Maybe that starts to start looking like a business. A business that, in the ideal situation, is a consumer who already wants what you're building because you asked her. Right. So you test and then you act on that feedback and then you test again. So one of the best things that could happen for your media business is viability, utility, is that fit. We're giving you what you asked for. It's not a gamble anymore. And then you get to fail fast. Rather than build your Nike factory for $20 million for hundreds of thousands of shoes, what if you tested one? And you said, what do you think? What's your loss? You fail quickly, but you fail at the price of one shoe. Then, I'm suggesting let's get out of media business, which is a brave thing to be a guy on stage with this crowd. <laughs> um, what if journalism, or the lack of journalism, or the long, long form, or short videos, or you know, AI, what if that's not the issue? What if it's not the issue at all? What if it's this? I'm going to say a weird thing. What if journalism was a service industry? 
right? What if we stopped being the content business? What if you're producing too much content? What if we stopped being the content business and then we started being this kind of business? It sounds weird, but let's, let's look at what problems are out there, right? These are problems, by the way, that have nothing to do with content. These have nothing to do with journalism, but they can. Sometimes we realize it in rooms like this around the world, and sometimes we don't, but in the media, we are immensely powerful. We're not powerful only because we make friends with politicians or businesses. We're powerful because we can help people with problems like this, really help them, you know, or like this. And then, what about this? Should I move my school closer to the better school where my kid wants to go, or should I move to the place that's cheaper in rent? What should I do? What about stories like that? What about that? We're all, half of us, at least half of us, are thinking this in this room right now. What about healthcare? How do I do insurance? Where can I buy cheap groceries? What about all this stuff? How do I make these decisions, right? We got into doing this thing, remember, because we were idealists. But what if that ideal was to help society with a need? A need that not we have assumed, but a need that we asked about. It's a simple, I'm not, Talking about tech solutions, I'm not talking about crowd tangle, I'm not talking about any of these, I'm talking about, hey, what do you need in your life, not media? So this is something that keeps me and Alan up at night, right? And this is, you know why we got into this? It was an irritation that there wasn't, that this was one of the only industries in the world that created product, but like, didn't ask the consumer whether they wanted that product. He's like, let's make more content, man. But my worry about this is this. What if you're currently creating some of the best journalism in your life right now, and then the person whose life it will change doesn't get to see it, or hear it, or read it, or listen? Then what? How scary is that? This is why we do what we do. We do what we do because we're fans of people like you. We think you guys are heroes, by the way. So, so you find us saying things like this. It's about the user. You can call them what you like. You want to call them your audience, your user, your customer. People hate it. Journalists hate it when I say customer. You call them listener, viewer, whatever you like. Up to you. It's driven by their demand, and it's driven by their interest. That's the future. We're not here to talk about the future of journalism. We're here to talk about the future of running a business that you can pay your rent with, you can pay your journalists with, you can enjoy your life with, and you can do spectacular journalism that people actually want. How about this? How about you're actually helping people change their minds, make their minds up, figure things out, right? How about scale? Doesn't mean more users. What if you figure this out for one tiny niche and you built that value along that niche and then you did it again and again and again? It's been done over and over again. So it's like the users telling you, right, in this little conversation, Hey, what about this exchange? I'm going to pay you in attention, and by and large, that leads to money, we're hoping. But help me solve this real specific problem I have that I told you about, right? What if my problem was your business opportunity? Sounds like the shoe business, right? I wish I could do this. I wish I could have a better projector. I wish I could have, you know, Solve my problem, I'll give you my attention. This person said, if you're not an entrepreneur in journalism, maybe it's time to get out of journalism. But she's pretty hardcore, as we know. So let's talk about the media business. 
We think it's not broken. We think it's changed a little bit. It's been transformed. Imagine, it's probably been transformed for the better. Let's figure out how. So we've been doing, you know, we, I should change this slide. It's not a decade. We know it's not. It's about three decades or five, right? We are trying to fit square pegs into round holes, right? We've made a business doing that. And then we complain about, like, man, it's not fitting, right? So what if we moved from mass to niche? And the reason I'm saying this is what, what if we changed our idea about how the audience, what this audience, this mythical audience is? What if it's not one audience? What if it's multiple tiny audiences? We've, we've seen this. We know this at the back of our heads. We know this. So the big mistake that we've made is that we think this is one audience. I've had a few conversations with people in this room about this. We keep saying, but the people want this. There's no such thing as the people. There's no such thing as the audience. I'm going to say this again later in the, in the, in the presentation. This is not how it works. Right? There's, surely we identify ourselves individually as people here more than this, no? Come on. There is no one audience. Because the promise of this internet thing that we all live our lives on is completely the opposite, right? It gives us this amazing opportunity to be very specific, hyper-specific. And this is huge power. I mean, let's face it, it's power that a little company called Cambridge Analytica used for really, really evil, evil ways, right? Evil um, results. It's, this is specificity, specificity. It's about niche. It's about people who are engaged, right? This is where we all came, some of us came from, you know. It was simple. Somebody spoke about this being the golden age of media. Things were simple back then. I ran it, I published it, and they came. Then it got a little more complicated. And then we were doing platforms. And then 3.0 meant that there were creators who didn't need the platforms. Maybe they did, maybe they built their own, maybe they didn't need you know, the editors to say, okay. And now we live here. Now it's just the endless cycle of endless nonstop media, right? It's on demand, it's real time, it's everywhere, it's multi-format, it's multi-audience, and it's really quite cheap. We're at the end of this gatekeeping age. We don't need your delivery trucks, we don't need your satellite uplinks, we don't need the, you know, any of that stuff anymore, right? You don't need the printing press for sure. So we've got to serve a need. We've got to be targeted. And to be able to do that, we have endless, endless, endless opportunity. We call this the golden age of media too. Because we're very optimistic. Alan and I, even though we're two grumpy old men that live in Singapore, we're actually very excited about all of this. I mean, think about it, right? Here we are. We have a publishing company in our pockets right now. In fact, some of us are actually publishing right now. You have everything you need. It's mostly for free, right? You have access to all the stuff that you don't know. You can learn it almost for free, right? I'm going to come to more of this. We find this very exciting, the fact that there's a media startup opportunity for every single interest out there right now. You can hire people, you can collaborate, you can get funding with people around the world. Never, never, never leave Kathmandu. You can learn what you like. And you can get paid, more or less, on most platforms. So how do you build this? Here comes the secret formula. How do you reach viability? You do this. Now this is very controversial. This is where people start referring back to that one audience. But what if people say they want sensationalism and flush and fluff? You ask people what they want. Let me tell you why this has worked. So this lady called Jessica Lesson, tiny, tiny, quick 
um, you know, uh, case studies. She set up this thing called the Information 2012 with a WordPress page. And she said, I do some of the best tech business stories in the world for the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal. She said, now I'm going to do it for myself. So set up a paywall if you want my reporting. You're going to have to pay $400 a year. And her co-founder was the tech guy who set up the WordPress page. She said, no, you're crazy. Many years later, she's a multi-million dollar company. And you now pay, I think, 800 bucks to be a member. But the things she, that you get as a member are things that we don't often think of as journalism. You know what she sells? She sells, apart from stories, apart from interviews, apart from panels, she sells attendance at events, which is great. She also sells the right to comment on the website. So you get a verified comment on the information website with your name. Your... Why? Because you get to be part of that conversation. You become part of the story. You become part of the narrative. You sell that. She sells organizational charts of tech companies because you need that as an investor. She asked people, she made a business of asking people what they want. Kirsten Hahn, even though she looks like she's 12 years old, is one of my personal heroes. She runs this thing called We the Citizens out of Singapore. She's an activist and she's a journalist. She's now the editor of the Mekong Review as well. But this thing is her newsletter and she runs it to teach people around um, civil, um, civil rights stuff around human rights, about freedom of expression, and about democracy in Singapore, which is challenging at times. <laughs> so let's go back to this user person and how we need to talk to them and listen. These guys have made an uh, enormous living out of talking to their users, sitting back, shutting up, and listening. And um, they do all of their news, the daily hours, on Instagram. Every single bit of it. They're getting into events, they're doing a whole bunch of stuff. They've got investment, they've, they've got plans. It's very exciting. Um, so how do we think about this? This thing about audiences. What do they want? How do we, how do, we do this? Maybe these are the questions we start asking ourselves. And then, how do we build content? And products, I'm going to call it products. I'm going to call your journalism products. Um, at a conference in 2019, a Brazilian guy here in Kathmandu at the Summit Hotel, I was running a workshop like this, and Antonio Juniao came to me, he's a big guy with dreadlocks, and he came to me and said, Richard, you have, I really love the way you're thinking, you know, but it, you know, it gives me a little problem with one of the words you used for my journalism. So I was like, what's that? I knew what he was talking about. He said, you call it a product. It's like, like shampoo. Is it the same as that? I said, you know, I like the fact that it made you feel weird. But what if it was as useful as that? What if it was as desirable as that? What if, I mean, do you use shampoo? He's like, ah, uh, and then he walked away luckily after giving me a hug. But yeah, uh, how do we build this stuff? And then how do we build something that's valuable enough to pay for? Right? That's the holy grail, right? How do we do this? How do we do? Let's talk about some evil companies. But they didn't start off being evil. OK. Let's figure this out. So these guys didn't come along and say, you know, we hate video, uh, video shops. They came along because they said, Listen, people seem to want movies. They don't want to pay late fees, and they want to find the movie they're looking for. What if we build something that people want? And then these guys, the other evil company, they came along and didn't come along because they hate cabs, right? They said, what if you could get a cab in the rain? Number one, I tried to get a cab in the rain last night. Kind of worked out. We had to say please a lot. What if he had change? What if he didn't overcharge you? What if he knew the way? That's what they found. Then, not kind of semi-evil people. They said, we didn't set out to kill the music industry. 
we wanted only three songs from the album. They built an entire business from this. Right? They invented the, the playlist. We used to make playlists. It was very difficult on tape. Some of us in this room remember that. This very evil company came along, not because they hated bookstores, but because they said, how about we get this at a bargain for everyone? And then these guys came along and said, these guys came along and said, what if we could all travel? And what if it wasn't an elite thing? And what if we could afford, it wasn't just about hotel rooms. What did they do? They did this. Why are we not doing this? Why do we find it so difficult? So we talk about the tech disruption, right? That's not what's disrupting our industry. Our big threat is this. It's not that difficult to solve. All we have to do is ask, what are your problems? What are you dealing with every day? What can I help you with? And then we listen, and we build something, and then, Simple, you do it for the rest of your life. <laughs> no big deal, right? And people are telling us. They are telling us what they want. It's everywhere. We just have to look, we have to listen. It's right there. I'm gonna remind you of this question. Think about this again. What if? Let's look at a, you know, we, you know how we were talking about Cambridge Analytica. These, just a quick experiment. What if we use the tools that we all use? If you want to boost something, a post on Facebook or a story or something, this is what you're confronted with. So we took, I think there's about 100. We took a partial list of all the options Facebook gives you for your ads or for your boost. It's a tiny portion. Don't worry, you're not supposed to read this. I'm going to focus on the moms. Look at all the kinds of moms here. I mean, it's crazy. Stay at home, new mom, preschool, high school. What if each one of these audiences is a media startup? Every single one. What if you focused, you asked them, what are you doing that isn't being done right now? Where's the opportunity? What problem can I solve for you? Green mom. And you serviced that opportunity and you obsessed about that problem until you went down the value chain and you made it useful, relevant, and valuable. What if? Let's look at Craigslist. What if, let's focus on the apartments bit. What if each one of these was a media business? An entire media business. How deep are these niches? Hundreds, thousands, millions? Look at these guys. Reddit calls itself the front page of the internet. I took the top 100 Reddits. And let's look at number two. Number two is a subreddit called IMA, which is basically introducing you to you know, different occupations around the world. IMA, at the time I took this screenshot, 21.3 million users, of which 3,000 were online at the time. 21 million. So here's the thing. Oh, and then there's these guys. Super niche, right? But niche is not about small. Niche is about being specific. And that's the magic that so many of these people have worked with and built businesses on. Simply because they decided, hey, user, you, person I'm doing all this journalism for, I'm gonna walk out of my newsroom, I'm gonna have a conversation with you for once, and I'm gonna ask you, what the heck are you struggling with? What do you do when you're bored? What do you do when you're worried? What are you worrying about? Tell me. This is where our opportunity is, right? We want to be informed, we want to be entertained, 
we want to be inspired. We want to want help with all those difficult decisions we was we were talking about, right? Every single thing. And now let's let's talk about competition while we're at it. Are you guys competing with each other here? I I beg to differ, and here's why. Right? Who is your real competition? Right now, there's a lot of competition for what I'm doing here on stage, right? You're getting that little notification, and it's going off on my phone, and it's going off somebody else's phone right there. Somebody's checking their message, somebody's got a call, somebody's got a WhatsApp, right? It's all the same to us. We're still getting that dopamine hit, right? What if that's your competition? What if all of these things we do, all of these things that we think we do for journalism, all of these are competing with each other, right? Every single one of them. So these guys put out an earnings report a couple of years ago, Netflix, and in their earnings report to their investors and shareholders, they said that we're not that worried about HBO or in fact Disney Plus, even though they lost to them. We're more worried about the time that kids spend playing this damn Fortnite thing. That's our competition. That's who we lose to. Any guesses for what? So then they started making video games, right? Now you play video games on Netflix. Well, who has, who has a guess for what the other big competitor is for Netflix? Anyone? major comp competition that they mentioned in their earnings report. It was literally, it was sleep, right? So who is your newsroom's competitor? And how do we stand up against them? How do we compete? What do we do? And then, once you figure out what your comp competition is, then you figure out how you define yourself. Is it by how much, how many basketball shoes you throw out there in the market? Or is it perhaps what need you're serving for specific users who have told you what their need is, what their problem is, what you can solve for them? It's user-driven. It's demand-centered. I'm I'm you can switch it around and it's based on the interest of the user. All we have to do is find out. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna end quickly. I'm gonna give you a quick case study from Myanmar. I'm putting this in for my friend Pranav, who I promised I would put this case study in for, from the record, which is right now off the record. Uh, let's look at Myanmar. We did this quick project, okay? Take yourself back to 2018. This is pre-coup Myanmar. This is pre-COVID world, right? These guys used to publish a weekly magazine, um, English and Burmese news. They did news stories. They did like an news analysis features, very hard political uh, stuff, always getting in trouble with the government. Um, the print magazine went very quickly from weekly to bi-weekly. How many of us are familiar with the story? Our print product went from daily to weekly to fortnightly to then monthly to then, man, we are really in very bad trouble. So we said, guys, you need a membership program. Why? There was this political climate, even before the coup, right, which was really dangerous. It was really, really worrying. We thought there was going to be a democratic transition. Well, you know, 2018, what, what could we have known? There was no revenue. Is this how, you know, this is, this, we've been talking about this all day, uh, in this room, you know, low circulation, there's pressure from government, there's pressure from commercials, there's pressure, pressure from readers, there's, there's editorial freedom is out the window. What do you do? So, you know, and, and, and the context here is Frontier was this rare bird. They got in trouble, but not as much trouble as the Burmese language media, because they published in English. So the government was like, okay, man, you know, they're not going to worry us too much. Um, and we realized that their core readers, their core international readers, were these guys. 
You know, we kept asking over and over, who are your readers? Everybody came up with these. Diplomats, journalists, NGOs, business people, and academics, researchers, you know. Um, let me tell you a little bit about this guy in the background. This is Sunny Shwe. He's our friend and the publisher of and owner of Frontier Myanmar. He's standing there, and I put the number 19 on top of his head for a reason. He's standing right there when I took this photograph back then, and he's really worried because he's got 19 people in that newsroom, and he hasn't paid their salaries at the time of this picture for five months. They've stuck with him because they've been with him forever. You guys, some of you know the story. We can't pay salaries. So it was really, this guy was really worried. People weren't looking him in the eye. So then they asked us, guys, you know, can you just build this membership product? We said, we don't know how to do this. So what the hell? No, no, let's ask the experts. What if we asked potential members? They're like, oh, okay, that's weird. So then we got a whole bunch of people over and over again. This is the Frontier Conference Room in Yangon. Very small, very cramped, but we had like many, many days we kept calling these people and saying, listen guys, can you help us with this? We're building a membership program and we would like your help because we'd like you to be members. We would also like your money. So, okay, can you come and spend like half an hour with us? And uh, we'll give you, uh, also in focus, anytime any one of you does audience research like this, Please buy lots of biscuits. We bought some of the most addictive biscuits from the tea shop down the road. And uh, this went over and over again. One focus group after another, non-stop. Diplomats, NGOs, journalists, businesses, academics. And we said, you know, a whole bunch of things. Like we asked them, you don't have to read this, but what problem are we solving for you? We think we are solving this problem. We think you, Mr. Diplomat, need this to be the smartest person in the room. We think you need this uh, as an NGO for your Monday morning meetings. Frontier can help you with your work to then be able to make some great policy decisions, um, etc. And we tested these. Some people said, no, that's crap. Some people said, no, 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 that's true. That's, that is a problem I need to solve. So we threw all these fancy things at that. We, oh, what about a Slack group and conference calls with newsmakers and what about data and what about... They said, no man, we, we don't want any of this rubbish. Please, can you give us very specific newsletters? And I'll come to those what, uh, in a bit. Can you give us events? We need to talk among ourselves. We need a forum. Hint, hint. Look at what you guys have built here. We need a forum. We need to hang out with you, your journalists, so you can tell us what happened behind the stories you publish. We want to be closer to you. And we want to support your mission. What's this weird thing called mission? We even asked, you know, would you take individual memberships? Would your institution also pay for this? Yes, please. Please do it. What is this mission? So this is what they asked for. So we talk about audience that buys my product. Great, fantastic, always good. What about a community that says, I am going to stand behind you come what may. I need you to exist. And for that, I will pay money. I might not even read your newsletter. I don't care. Some people want to be members because, and they will pay for this right and privilege, because they want you to exist. So it's not a recurring payment in exchange for something. It's please continue to uphold these values for which I respect you and I would like to support that. I would like to be part of the membership community. Here were the newsletters. They specifically asked for them, right? They were very, very tightly briefed. They said, a lot of us don't speak Burmese. Can you translate top 10 headlines? every day? Can you send this to me in some form? Oh, you don't want to read it on the website. How, what format do you need? Format? What about a newsletter? Quickly, skimmable, while I'm on the way to work? Fantastic. Okay. 
I want to know what's going on in Parliament. Can you give me specific media, what's going on in the media in tech, gender, gender rights and stuff? I want policy stuff. Can you send me specifics for this? Sure. No problem. We'll test it out. We, I want to know what's going on behind the scenes. And then, this one was really good. You know who gets the members updates newsletter? The non-members. Just to create that little scarcity. Here's what the members are doing. Don't you want to be a part of this amazing group? This worked really well. As I said, events are journalism. Here we are, practicing journalism, right? And this thing has become amazing. Now they're able to do a whole bunch of blended events. Their Facebook group has buzzing. They have all these online events with all these people weighing in at the UN, at Parliament, at you know, experts in their field, serious policy folks. It's really, really quite exciting. And Frontier Memberships was born, you know, and then coming back to those 19, we were able to launch just before the pandemic. I finally got the site design ready. I got all of the branding ready. We were working like crazy on this thing. And finally, we were able to pay salaries with arrears. We paid backlog salaries. And we continue to do that today. And even though they're, they've moved on um, by force as well, They've had to get the hell out of Myanmar for fear of torture, imprisonment, death. We've heard some horrific stories. This is why we go to Chiang Mai so often. We actually built and designed this co-working space, which, which, which kicked off literally in February. We were there for the launch uh, for the exiled Burmese community and the larger regional journalist community to come and find a safe space. One of its biggest features is, apart from great Wi-Fi, and podcasting booths is Burmese tea. So you get that taste of Myanmar. When you have no home, you've left your kids behind, you've left your parents behind. It's, it's really something. So this whole thing about audience, right? How do I stress how serious this is? It's not about engagement, right? You've got to take that commitment a little further. <laughs> so five quick things. How do we build this thing? Server community. We've seen this over and over. Puma Podcast in the Philippines asked us to figure out, you know, hey, Carl came to us, the CEO, and said, listen, we make stuff for people to listen to. We make podcasts. Now we need to listen to our audience. Can you splice guys help us do this show? Sure. So we set up a whole bunch of focus groups. What are some of the first things that their community is telling them? We don't care that you make podcasts. You should have seen the faces of that management team. Think, what the hell? It's in our name. Puma podcast. What do you mean? No, no, we don't care if you make ball bearings or podcasts. Or it's fine. They're great. Why do you come to us? Because you give us a safe space in very politically polarized Philippines. We know that we can trust you guys. We know that... So we want to we want to come to this safe space. We want to come and pay you so we can do a week's internship at Puma Podcast. He's like, don't you know how, like, work works? That's not how jobs work. You want to pay us to work for us? I said, yeah. And then the other feedback was, can you please give us more ways to give you money? I can't find a like. How do I give you for what? Just I I want to support you. This is what happens. You, weird things, you start to learn weird things about your company when you speak to your audience. They will tell you what you do. So serve a community. You find need and utility. You find relevance. You share all these things. But what else do you share? You share problems. And what's the next best thing to have, finding, you're not, finding that somebody wants to solve your problem? You're not alone. You have other folks that have the same problem. This is magical. So you find that value in this utility, and then you build slowly. We built Splice from one single newsletter, because we thought that the media, media community around the world, and especially in Asia, needed to be served. 
So let's talk about some uncomfortable questions. I promise after this I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. How many people can you name in your audience? First names. When did you last meet someone who reads or watches or listens to your stuff? Like hang out with them. Maybe it's not about your CMS. When was the last time you figured out that, man, if I didn't exist, do peop would people miss us? I spoke to Pranav today. And he's talking, yay! <laughs> Pranay. And he's talking about the, uh, the fact that he closed his thing down a year ago, and people are still writing to him, saying, hey, uh, man, are you guys online anytime soon? I was very excited. Here we are again at this question. It still haunts me, but I've changed it a bit. How do you make sure it reaches these people who desperately need your journalism? Not you decide. This is not you deciding they need it. We're in the business of deciding what people need. What if we asked them? What if they told us? Understand what to scale, what not to scale. Maybe it's not about more content. What if you halved the amount of content you did? Would it really make a difference? Would you be able to spend more time, more resources, figure out what your audiences wanted, right? It's hard work. It's none of this is easily scaled. We don't use tech. We use like Google Meet and we use rooms like this. And we say, hey man, you will buy your coffee for half an hour of your time. I'm planning to do this series on women who have financed jobs, who also need childcare, who like coffee. I don't know. Can you tell us uh, if we're on the right track? Are we solving the right problem for you? Even if they say no, you're failing fast, you're failing cheap, and you started a conversation. We write to every single person who signs up for our newsletters. Every single person. Alan writes one, I write one. Every week, we hate it. But we know it has to be done. It is the best lead generation engine we've ever had. It's a free newsletter. I write one on product, he writes one on media intelligence. I edited his just now before I came down here. Every single subscriber gets a little personal email. Hey, Kanak, it's nice to, thanks for signing up. What do you do? You know, If he's got like himalmedia.com after his name in the email address, we'll say, what do you do at Himal Media? Are you in Singapore? Oh, I'm coming to Kathmandu. You're in Kathmandu. Can we have a coffee? We'd love to know what you... We're excited about you guys, seriously. We do this because we want to, not because it's some cool tactic. We love it. Here I am talking about attention again, but it's about scarcity, right? Content, the problem with content, it's abundant. Nobody wakes up every morning and says, man, I wish I had some more content today. Man. <laughs> right? I don't know, I could be wrong. <laughs> Solve a problem. Let's get in the problem-solving business. And let's not assume what those problems are. Let's go and ask. What if it was this? What if this was our business? There are people, enough people breaking the news. Good luck, CNN. Well done. Right? Formats don't matter. It doesn't matter what tech, what podcast, what AI, what newsletter, what, who cares? It doesn't matter. Those are just ways to begin a conversation. Nobody really, is, we say, yeah, I prefer to meet people in, in, in person rather than texting versus on a phone call. These are formats. We'll figure out the formats later. And the reason I put this here, journalists hate it when I say this. What if the problem to solve is my government has just announced a budget I don't bloody understand it, because all you're giving me is four legs of copy and two guys shaking hands like this and looking at the camera. And that's supposed to explain this budget to me. What the hell do I do with this? 
shouldn't you publish a calculator instead? I am a saleswoman. I work in, I make this much money. I don't have kids. I have, here's what the budget means to me. Right? Who knows? Stand out. So it's about attention and all of that. But how do you get that product market fit? It's before we do that podcast, before we do that story, that series, that article, that series of article, you know, that photojournalism, you know, what if we spoke to people before then and said, hey, boss, even 20, 10, get people in a room, chat to them, and said, I'm planning to do this. What do you think? So a little pledge, a moment of silence, let us all hold hands <laughs> and pledge that we stop making basketball shoes for people who want football boots. And that's how I think you should do it. And that's the end of that.